Vehicle packed inside, ready for the off. Well, here we are, finally leaving Darwin on our four day trek across the New South Wales. It should be a fun and adventurous trip. We're going to be going straight down the Stewart Highway to Alice Springs, spend a couple of days in Alice Springs, then across the uh, Plenty Highway across which is quite a long dirt road into New South Wales and then we're going to make our way down to Coffs Harbour. We're going to have a look at a few survival things along the way, a few camping ideas, should be a lot of fun. So buckle up and enjoy the trip. the top 
driving pretty much the whole day. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon, and about 200 kilometers north of Tennant Creek. So I thought I'd just pull over on the side of the road. It's gonna get a little fire going, have a cup of tea, have a late lunch, just have a bit of a break. You can see it's quite a beautiful area. Now all the, the lush uh, savannah country of the north, as you can see, is given way to, we've got some stone country and lots of spin effects bush. And it's a quite a different topography than what we've come from. And from here in, into the centre, into Alice Springs, you're going to find it's going to become more sparse and we're going to see a lot, lot more uh, dirt, a lot more spin effects. But um, it's a beautiful country. Just saw a couple of uh, a nice big brown snake actually, but I wasn't quick enough to get him on film. So I'm going to get a fire going, and have a cup of tea and a well-earned break. Quickly got a fire going, got a uh, cup of tea on the go or some hot water to make a cup of tea so I'm just going to sit back, relax, have a couple of banana sandwiches for lunch and a nice cup of tea for break. I had to build a very quick firewall around here because we have a predominant wind coming from this direction so just to shield the fire from the from the wind obviously to stop the um, any ammers from spreading and just to contain it I've just erected a very quick wall. My brew kit and nothing like a good Yorkshire tea. Just to sweeten it up a bit. Don't really like sugar. We all know how bad sugar is for you. Try to use a bit of natural organic honey. And if it's collected from nature, it shouldn't be any other way. So that's all contained in my brew kit. Now when it comes for a quick feed, I like nice and simple. Some wholemeal or multi-grain bread. A little bit of banana shoved in the middle. Nice quick meal on the go. And there you go. here when I finish lunch I quickly pack up make sure this fires out properly leaving no sign that I was ever here and going to get back on the road and make our way down past Tennant, Tennant Creek we'll probably camp the night um, on the southern side of Tennant Creek and then continue our journey to Alice Springs tomorrow Here we are at uh, Tennant Creek and uh, I'm about to get some fuel. It's been about well, two and a half hour drive from where we had lunch and I'm going to get some refuel and we're going to look for a camping spot for the night outside of town. Well it's been a long drive today and uh, it's after dark and I'm about 10-15 uh, k's south of Tennant Creek. So collected some firewood. As you can see I've got a fire going, got the billy on having a nice coldie while I wait 
going to make some dinner and I'm going to get some uh, sleep and uh, get off early tomorrow morning. So, cheers and I'll see you in the morning. Waking up in the outback is absolutely magical. Last night was beautiful. I had the whole sky just filled with stars. It really was, was something wonderful. I'm going to get up now and uh, put a put a cupper on and uh, have some breakfast, have a shower and uh, we'll get on our, on our way and make our way to Alice Springs. <sighs> See what the flies are bloody crook. The further you get into Central Australia the worse they get. It reminds me of uh, flies we used to get when I grew up in the New South Wales country town of Moree. Loads of flies and <laughs> it's just like that. I was having a walk around the area this morning and I've come across this. This is uh, one of the many varieties of eucalypt that house the uh, bush coconut, also known as the bloodwood apple, because it's found on a, um, a lot of variety or a particular variety of eucalypts called bloodwoods. It's uh, a good bush tucker. The last time I saw these was when I was in the Pilbara last year. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab a couple of these, we're going to take them back to camp and have a look. But essentially it's just a gore. And we're going to split it open, and there's an edible grub inside, well hopefully there's an edible grub inside, but you can eat the, eat the grub, and the lining itself tastes uh, a bit like coconut, and I say a bit like coconut, it's not exactly like coconut, but like a lot of the early settlers, when, when they first came here, they were looking for comparisons, so things that they tried, they had to uh, associate with something else. So, uh, it's, uh, we'll take these back to camp, and we'll crack one open and have a look. Well, I've brought a few of these back to camp. I actually tried some of the, uh, the bigger ones, and they were actually quite um, dead, and they are all... Uh, bit past their use by date and side. So what I've got, I've got, I've, got, I've actually going to get some smaller ones and try those. That's better. I'm going to cut into that and find our grub. our grub. So that coconut, I've just squished him, but had a few of these now and they're quite nice. I know it doesn't look that appetizing but it's all in the head. Hmm. Good. Actually, the tastiest part is a grub. Organic, no preservatives. So that's the bush co coconut or bloodwood apple.
driven about 100 kilometres since our camp spot this morning and we've stopped at a place called the Devil's Marbles, or well, traditional name is Kalu Kalu. And this was a traditional sacred uh, dreaming site of the uh, of four Aboriginal groups in this area. Very significant site and with lots of uh, spiritual uh, history here. Um, absolutely, it's all granite, it was sandstone, it's uh, sandstone that's been eroded down, we've just got the rare granite left and it's all around this area, it's absolutely beautiful and there are lots of stories, traditional Aboriginal stories associated with this. Us being um, white people, we're only allowed to hear the very basic story. Uh, in order to hear the uh, only certain people are, are told all the stories associated with all Aboriginal sites around Australia and uh, it depends upon your position within that uh, language group. So this is Kalu Kalu. Spectacular country. All oh, this whole area was of tremendous significance to Aboriginal people. And since first contact with uh, Europeans and, and when they first came to this country, there's been, uh, despite massacres and the land, they put the uh, overland telegraph right through this area. Rocks were taken to use as gravestones on uh, certain Europeans' graves. And a whole swag of uh, ridiculous uh, activities went on just through ignorance and, and lack of education. And, uh, but now that's changing, there's gradually the uh, Aboriginal people of the area have uh, got all their land back, as they rightfully should, and now it's joint managed by the uh, National Parks and Wildlife and the traditional owners of the area. And that's a great uh, step forward, and we're hoping that that's happening around the country, and that that's going to continue with all the, the uh, Aboriginal uh, areas that uh, need to be given back to their uh, rifle owners. Well, we're almost at Alice Springs. It's been a fantastic drive. Uh, it's been quite hot. And the countryside topography has been excellent. Uh, it's just got a lot of beautiful, rich red uh, uh, sand and ground. Obviously, you've got high iron ore content, and it's uh, is what you what typifies the desert of the uh, central outback of Australia. Really is beautiful. And uh, we're not too far about, about now, so we'll. Uh, Hopefully the road will be in a, in a pretty good state. Have to 
what you're looking at behind me is a termite mound. Now when I'm tour guiding in Kakadu up near Darwin, there's two types of uh, termite mounds we come across and that's uh, the cathedral termite mound and the magnetic ter termite mound. I'm not exactly sure what this one's called, but basically the life cycles of, uh, and uh, the structure of termite uh, colonies are very, very similar. Pretty much we have a king and a queen. The queen in the insect kingdom can live to 30 years old. It's pretty amazing as far as insects are concerned. We have soldiers and we have worker uh, termites as well as nymphs and reproductives. And pretty much 70% of the nest is made up of uh, uh, soldiers and workers and the other 30% is made up of reproductive nymphs and then we have the king and queen on top of that. Once a year the uh, nymphs and reproductives fly up into the into the uh, air uh, usually around the wet season and they mate, go to ground and they form a new termite mound. This termite mound you're looking at here like the ones in the Northern Territory could be I'd say at least 20, 25 years old, could be older. So it's a massive structure. To give you some idea of scale, termites are blind. It'll be equivalent to having, say, two million blind factory workers building a skyscraper that's two miles high and about six city blocks wide. That's how big these structures are. And this one, as we said, is about 30 years old, in my guess. Aboriginal people had a lot of uses for termite mounds. Basically, the inner, inside of a termite mound holds heat really, really well, so they're great for cooking. You can actually dig a channel into the termite mound itself, create an oven, so it actually holds the heat. The other thing you can use is using the inside. They're slightly different, uh, more smaller honeycomb construction in the Northern Territory. You can take that and you can stick it on the fire and it makes a great insect deterrent. The mosquitoes here aren't so bad when you get inland, however the flies are bloody annoying, but that was one of the uses I used uh, uh, the termite mound for in the Northern, uh, Northern Territory, right up the top of the dome. So cooking, it's actually, it's actually wonderful. Really good for putting a base in a, in a ground oven. So I'm gonna get to have a quick cup of coffee uh, and get on my way again. Uh, we've probably traveled about uh, 500 kilometers so far. We've still got a fair bit to go until we uh, get to the Queensland border. Probably about another two hours, I would say and we're going to look for a camp tonight, um, hopefully before dark tonight. I'm going to make myself a quick cup of tea. And when I'm on the road in the car, a great piece of kit to have is a jet boil. Uh, it only takes a couple of minutes to boil the water. Really quick and handy, obviously. There's no need for me to light a fire, and um, this is going to be a little bit quicker than having to get a fire and get some water on the go. So, great piece of kit. So, I simply take the bottom off, There's a few different configurations that these come in. And I'm going to show you one of those today. So all we do is put our gas bottle on our tripod just for our stable stabilization base. Now these come with their own inbuilt striker, these ones, so it's uh, some of the smaller ones don't, and you have to use a source to uh, put them together. I'm just using this uh, little bush here as a uh, windbreak. Some of them come with this option, it's great, because then you can actually stick a cup. Most of them, most of the time you boil, boil your water in the actual uh, receptacle that comes with it. But I actually also like to put a cup directly onto the top. It's an extra piece of kit you need to buy, but it works nicely. on oh, it's a little bit windy that shouldn't take any time it's going to get my bag you use that as a windbreak my 
cooking kit. It's my cooking kit I like to use. And that should be boiled in no time. Okay, that's boiling now. Turn him off. Some coffee. I'm actually a tea drinker. Don't really drink coffee that much, but when you're driving, it's obviously it has a, it's a bit stronger than tea, so it's uh, better for staying a bit more alert. But it's always like these uh, small travel satchels. in tea but to me it just tastes just as good in coffee and as before just a little bit of powdered milk don't have to worry about keeping it cold nothing needs refrigerating refrigerating then and powdered milk keeps it nice and hot Cheers. I'll drink this cup of coffee, then we'll pack up and we'll, we'll be on our way again. We'll hopefully another two hours travel and we'll start looking for a camp spot for tonight. Mm, it's a spot. All that to, uh, to our south is the Simpson Desert. We're skirting along, the, heading east along the top of the Simpson Desert. Heading towards the Queensland border, and we're about uh, about 140 kilometres from that. Now, don't be fooled by all the green vegetation. Now, just because we have green vegetation doesn't mean it's not a desert. Remember, a desert is characterised by a lack of water. It is very dry and arid out there. A desert doesn't always have to have just a sparse sand dunes. There's many, many different sorts of deserts. The heat is quite hot, it's very dry, and you need to make sure you've got a lot of water. I'm carrying in uh, water containers about 30 litres of water plus another 6 to 7 litres in separate containers at various places in the car. I've also got plastic bags that I can use for uh, transpiration bags and vegetation if need be. If we get time, I'll uh, show you some of that tomorrow. Got to our campsite uh, just on dusk. Would have liked to have gotten here a little bit earlier, but it doesn't work out that way. I was intent on making it to the Queensland border, but um, I've come to a nice area off the road. We've got a little a gully down here. I've made a fire in this little old creek line, and that's shielding the, the fire from wind. And I don't have to do much clearing. I've got some water on to have a cuppa, and uh, and some water on also for uh, to make some dinner with. Should be a good night, beautiful night out tonight. Actually, I'm looking forward, forward to a good night's sleep in the swag. So I'll give you a look around camp in the morning and we're looking to head off pretty early. So I'll see you then. Swag 
it's a wonderful way to sleep outdoors if you haven't used one before. I like the swags like this, but it's nice and simple, just like the traditional swag without the built-in mosquito net or shelter. Uh, small and compact to spit straight on your, uh, on your on your vehicle. Remember, this is used for rainy vehicle camping. Obviously, if you're hiking in somewhere, you're not going to carry a big swag on your back. You're going to use a small, lightweight sleeping bag, etc. But when it comes to vehicle camping, swags are fantastic. The other indispensable bit of kit is a tarp. Now, a tarp, this can be used for anything. The uses of this is a really multi-purpose. And like our survival kits, a tarp is essential. We can use it for working under the car. It can be um, to keep rain off your head, tablecloth, mat, anything. And I keep this in the back of the car so it's accessible all the time. And really, this is the manner of uses I put this to is um, staggering. So a good, ta good tarp, also ex excellent piece of kit. Well, last night it was a little bit breezy before I went to bed, so I put the fire out. But I didn't want any sort of risk of uh, bushfires. So what I thought I'd do this morning is show you how I lit the fire last night. And I used a traditional method of keeping steel to light the fire. Now I've shown this in another episode. I found some quartz on the side of the road yesterday. And I've just got my uh, piece of fencing wire, which I um, had tempered. And I've got some charcoal. Just once again, I'll put the charcoal on top of the uh, quartz. Get my striker. And all I do is just strike down. It's a bit breezy. As you can see, put that in the. Uh, it's got some dry grass. This morning when I woke up I could hear loads and loads of finches and finches are a great indicator of fresh water because they don't stray too far from fresh water. So I followed the gully where I had my fire 
and it led down to this small dam here. And so whenever you hear finches in the outback, it's a great, or any, a lot of other great eating birds, such as pigeons, it's a great indicator of fresh water because they won't stray too far from it. And this watering hole, I would say, would be used by many animals, not just uh, the introduced cattle, but a lot of native animals, animals would use this as well. All around this area, I've found some rock, chert, with a lot of high uh, silicon content. So it's going to be great to be used as flint, not only for um, flint and steel fire lighting, but for making tools. When I, so I'm going to collect some for flint napping. It's nice and smooth inside, and I bet you if I looked hard enough, I might be able to find some um, old Aboriginal flint tools because this is exactly the sort of stuff they would have used to make tools. So to make tools requires a special skill called flint napping and uses predominantly pressure flaking and percussion flaking. It's uh, quite a difficult skill to learn, it needs lots and lots of practice. So I'm actually going to go around and collect some of this. I'm guessing it's a type of chert. Um, quartz, chert, but it's perfect for making tools. So I'm going to go and have a look at it, look around a little bit to see what, what, what pieces I can find and take, take them back home with me. And I'll keep my eye out because I might be able to find some Aboriginal tools as well. about 10 minutes after uh, packing up camp and leaving this morning and we've come across this and this is very typical of um, Outback Australia it's a road and an airstrip at the same time and this is mainly used for the flying doctor service where they use um, Outback roads the roads are upgraded just for a section of the airstrip and they usually cordon it off if there's a plane about to land so it's um, you'll see these dotted all over the country in remote areas as you can see we're on the airstrip itself which is the road as well and this is where the flying doctors servers would land we're coming up to the end of the airstrip now Places in Australia can go where you don't see some signs. 
heading south on our way to Vidowry and we're just crossing the Tropic of Capricorn which is 23 and a half degrees south of the equator. So this is as far as the south the sun comes. Well we're actually rotating but around the sun so this is as far south as the sun comes in its uh, passage south and that'll arrive here around the 25th of December. equivalent tropic on the northern hemisphere which is 23 and a half degrees north which is the tropic of cancer so the tropic of capricorn got about another hour to go until we get to Bedauri. just on dusk I've dug a quick fire pit and uh, I've got to get a fire going because I'm losing light otherwise you're not going to be able to see anything so I've just grabbed some dried grass I've got a very small amount of wood enough to get it started I'm just buffing these up buffing the uh, buffing the tinder up so that it's nice and fluffy and will take a spark for my ferro rod Turn upside down, sparks want to go up. There's plenty of other firewood to hand, so that's a very quick rush job. Took me about five minutes to get all that out quickly, dig that trench. A couple of minutes to get a little bit of firewood. Sometimes you always don't have time to do the preparation you'd like, but I know I'm going to get a that's going to be going in a very small second. And there we go, I'll come back in a minute, get the rest of the camp set up and hopefully give you a look at the sunset before it uh, completely goes down. I've just literally pulled into a causeway, driven cross country about uh, a couple of hundred metres, just into an area where I'm going to set up camp for the night, just on a, on a dried up creek bed there is a little bit of water in one section I might even see if there's some yabbies tomorrow but that'll all depending on timing once again another night under the stars 
absolutely picturesque and beautiful. I just pulled along here. There's a river very nearby. Well, what's left of a dried up creek bread, a little bit of water in it. I had to get the uh, mosquito net out, the bell shaped mosquito net last night because the uh, mozzies were pretty bad. Good morning. That was a beautiful night last night. It got a bit chilly actually, despite that there's still quite a lot of mosquitoes around. So I used one of those bell mozzie nets. Now usually in, in the army we use a, uh, a small box style mosquito net, keeps a low profile. Sometimes I'm out camping, obviously you don't have to worry about not being seen. I like this bell style because it's one point, one point fixture and um, very simple to erect and very quick to take down as well. It actually works quite well. That's one of the double ones. So it fits nicely over your, um, uh, over your swag. Plus if you're working outside under a desk or something like that, and you have to use your computer or anything like that or even reading at night under a light that uh, the double one actually could sit over your top would be quite nice to just stop the uh, mozzies that's probably more for the northern territory however you could use it for the flies because uh, further we're getting uh, obviously down south we're getting these sort of flies <laughs> ever present flies so i'm just having a nice morning cup of tea and uh, i'll sort of get have some breakfast have some cereal soon then start packing up and then we'll be on our way again. Hopefully we'll, we're not that far from Windora and uh, we'll make our way further southeast. Well, last night we had quite a lot of mosquitoes, so I thought I'd put up a mosquito net. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of mosquito nets I like to use. I often use the box style mosquito net, which is a low profile um, kind of mosquito net we use in the army. You need two trees to erect that and a couple of sticks to act as spaces, but that works quite well. The other kind of mosquito net is the uh, bell style mosquito net, which is this one here. And this is a double. And the beauty about this is that it has one fixed point. So it's very quick to erect and pull down after use. Once you've tied it up, all you need to do is splay it out so it's around the, uh, the base of your swag and it's that quick and easy. I don't really use tents that often. Um, I prefer to be out um, with nature as close as I can and ten, tents tend to have a, a wall around me and that sort of barrier. Obviously in really cold windy weather a tent's a, a good option but for, for most of my camping I like to actually use um, a tarp or just a swag and nothing else. So um, yeah it's a great option if you want to, it's a very quick and uh, easy kind of mosquito net to erect. The other great thing about these Bell Styles mosquito nets is that you can have a desk working outside reading, you can actually stick one of these up under a tree and it stops bugs getting into the light at night when you've got that uh, light source and it allows you to read or anything like that. So it's actually quite versatile but the double ones are the way to go, way to go. the single ones are just too small.
just walking over to this huge uh, sand monitor that I've, that I've just spotted. It's quite a big fella. Also known as a goanna. Here's his hiding there, pretending he can't be seen. Here we have a monitor litter or goanna. And he's not happy. It's all right, big fella. He's a big fella. He's about a good metre long, this fella. He's not too happy with me being here. But isn't he beautiful? Settle down. King Brown here. And have a look at this guy. What we have here guys is a, a King Brown snake. See how big he is? I'm keeping my distance because he is, I'm trying to think if he's dead or not. Unfortunately he is, yeah. Here. It's a dead King Brown. Poor bugger. Someone just clipped him. And he's a big boy. Someone just run over him, I'd say. I'd say that just happened not long ago. This is uh, Toowoomba. Well, we've just crossed over from Queensland into New South Wales. We're just coming up to Coolangatta. The Gold Coast. We went via uh, from Dorby through to Toowoomba, um, through the freeways and the outer skirts of Brisbane, and uh, now we've just come down the freeway into Gold Coast, Coolangatta, obviously skirting the outside of it, and uh, heading south into New South Wales. It's uh, yeah, so it's been quite a long trip. I've got about another 
stopped at Woodburn, only a couple of hours away from home. It's been a long bloody trip. Long day today. About five or six days. So not too much further to go. It's nice to be in my home territory. Looking at the uh, some of the waterways we go fishing in. So uh, just stop to get a coffee. Just to uh, remain awake. Obviously got to remain alert, particularly travelling at night and after a long trip. my destination after uh, five, almost six days on the road from Darwin 